this computer. All right, folks, so I'm really happy that Adrian Sampson from Cornell, uh, the Ithaca campus, I have to uh, be clear, I guess, these days, uh, the real campus, uh, is here uh, to talk to us about accelerator design languages. Uh, he is kind of one of the few people at the intersection of architecture and PL. And uh, I'm excited to hear what uh, he's got to say. So go for it. Awesome. I'm delighted to be here. It's um, This is my first time doing a um, virtual seminar, anything uh, along these lines. So I am I'm super excited to talk to you all. Uh, as much, I know that this is a difficult format for it, but I, I am actually going to ask you some questions in here. So like, please, uh, like, be ready to unmute and of course to to interrupt. I'm not going to be watching like the hand raisey thing or whatever, but like you can if you can uh, get my attention, please do. Um, great. So I want to talk about designing hardware accelerators. Um, so by that I mean not just designing hardware in general, but designing hardware that is meant to like speed up computation as part of an application. So you might have heard like the buzzwords like domain specific architectures or whatever this is the this is the same thing i'm curious about how we improve the access to people uh to to design their own custom hardware to take advantage of this brave new world of uh of heterogeneous computing and the overall thesis i'm going to leave you with is that the design especially for reconfigurable hardware like fpgas has been so far too dominated by computer architects and there is a real balance to be struck between the influence of the architecture and the influence of uh, programming languages, ideas, and compilers, and the thinking that comes from the other end of the spectrum, from, uh, from as the slide says, like the PLDI mindset. Uh, but we're not there yet. They've been, the tools and the languages that we use to design accelerators, I think, are too far balanced on one side and the other. Okay, to motivate kind of what I'm talking about here, I want to ask what is uh, possibly on some of your minds, which is what is an FPGA in the first place? And th this is the first time I actually want people to unmute themselves. I I'm interested in anyone's like uh, capsule summary of what an FPGA actually is. Keep it to one sentence, but does anyone like have an explanation? You're not allowed to just expand the acronym, by the way. Give it a shot. Right, this, uh, is, this is Tom. I'll, I'll, I'll take a shot. I mean, what I've done. heard in talks is that it's it's a device where you can uh, download a program that it, you can think of as, as a circuit to compute something, and uh, and it's reconfigurable. Although, to be honest, I don't know at what granularity it's reconfigurable. That's great. Yeah, in fact, in some ways, that's a more uh, a more complete answer than I often hear when I ask people this question. Like I've gotten the answer, for example, that it's a like a, a magic circuit that can that can emulate any other circuit, which is like sort of true and that's sort of the idea. But like it's it's an oversimplification where of course really what's going on is that it's a piece of hardware like any other that you can program. And but the tricky part about it is that the programs that it's running are meant to emulate what an actual real physical circuit would do. So I think when answering this, it's actually uh, important to sort of like divide an FPGA, the definition of an FPGA into two different categories based on what you actually want to use an FPGA for. Um, traditionally, uh, an FPGA is like, is a circuit emulator. That is like for one reason or another, you would love to have a circuit, but you don't want to like pay the costs of actually making a physical circuit. So one reason that you might do that is that you have like really low volume, for example, that you would really like something that's a circuit uh, for your uh, image processing or your uh, wireless communication or something, but you only expect to make, you know, a few tens of thousands of them. And therefore it doesn't uh, behoove you to like, to pay the enormous startup cost to actually manufacture silicon for it. And this is by far, I want to emphasize the like main reason that FPGAs are used today is that like you actually literally want a circuit um, and it, it generally speaking isn't like it's, it's you're not using it as an accelerator of any real sense you are using it as like a cheaper alternative to get an actual chip and that's distinct from the kind of buzz around FPGAs that is uh, slowly emerging now but like honestly is a tiny minority of, of what FPGAs are really used for in the world which is that they are 
an accelerator, they're like a compute unit that you can use to do actual work to like offload computation from like a traditional compute unit, like a CPU. So you can think of it as like, in essence, no different really from a GPU in the sense that it is like good at some computations and can make them extremely efficient depending on like how well your computation fits that pattern. Um, and it, uh, is, it's different from a CPU. You have something else to buy and you have like very different programming uh, problems. And FPGAs are super exciting in terms of their advantages over other like you know more traditional compute units like CPUs and GPUs for a whole bunch of domains that I'm showing on the slide. Uh, and th this this is I'm making this distinction because I'm going to be talking exclusively about the right hand side of this diagram. That is to sort of to keep in mind that there are two different ways you can think about an FPGA, and one of them has to do with like being close to what a circuit actually does. Another one is about like accomplishing a computation and making it very efficient. And those goals are pretty distinct from each other. And they deserve, I think, different programming patterns. Just to sort of like take some of the star power that FPGAs have gotten and convey it here. The latter thing that is like an accelerator for specific kinds of computations that is like in some sense general and not just doing one thing. Uh, that is what is behind, if you've heard, for example, of Microsoft's tremendous success deploying FPGAs in the data center for search and now machine learning. And uh, one of my favorite examples is that surprisingly, Apple now sells FPGAs. You can buy a, a PCI card that is marketed as a, a, a video encoding accelerator, but inside of it, it is actually an FPGA. And so that's what's going on here is that it doesn't really matter that this is a circuit emulator. That, like there's no sense in which the, uh, that these applications require that the the the, uh, the programs being loaded on FPGAs look anything like circuits. The whole point is to get the efficiency and performance from specific computational patterns. Does this distinction make sense? Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. This is Mark Hill. You want to, so the insight why Microsoft seems to be all in FPGAs, where like Google and Amazon seem less interested, is it? Is it that Doug Berger is a force, or there's a diversity of solutions, or something else? That's a super good question. I wish I knew the answer. Obviously, some part of it has to be that Doug Berger is a force, right? Like that, that is that they're that that specific group and that specific uh, set of ideas is pushing things forward. Um, I, uh, I'm, I'm. It, it's it's really hard to say. Although, like, if I uh, if I had to guess, it's uh, there's. Uh, there is so much excitement around heterogeneous hardware that it's also easy to see why people are excited about taping out special purpose ASICs for more and more domains too. That is like FPGAs are not the only way to get heterogeneous, like, you know, to, to sort of exploit the explosion of heterogeneity in hardware. And like, it's easy to see, for example, why Google is so invested in uh, designing special purpose hardware instead of buying FPGAs. Does that partially answer your question, Mark? Yeah, what can you do? That's good. Great. I have a, I have a, question. a question. Sorry. Yeah. Matt, go, go ahead, Alice. Yeah, I was just gonna ask at, at a high level, why are FPGAs fast? So I understand like GPUs can do things at a massively parallel scale. Um, but uh, what what is so special about FPGAs uh, in um, these uh, domains? That is yeah, to to be honest, that is yet another like deceptively difficult question that I would love to have a actual answer to and something that like we ponder a lot in my group, which is like, what are FPGAs actually good at and what makes them good at that? Like you, it's pretty easy to answer like physically, what is an FPGA? It is like a gigantic uh, kind of data flow interconnected grid of small, uh, of like extremely primitive units. Um, and there's, there's something about that that makes them good at doing uh, like, computations that have abundant parallelism and possibly very irregular parallelism. Um, but like beyond that, I, I wish that I had a better answer to like what, like if you were to look at a computation, how would you decide, you know, is this amenable to FPGA acceleration? Small data words are also good. Right. Um, so, so this actually dovetails nicely with what I wanted to ask too, Adrian. Um, so I'm curious when you're talking about these examples, what sort of form factor you're thinking about? And the reason I'm asking is, uh, you know, in the past I've talked to, for example, you know, some of the mobile chip designers about, you know, why it would be beneficial to put FPGAs in mobile phones. And their answer was always, 
you know, yeah, that sounds good in practice, but how are we going to reprogram, you know, people's phones, setting aside even the ethical, you know, concerns of that, you know, physically, how are we going to going to be able to do that? And so they had always shied away from FPGAs, sort of like you said, with Google um, and put and moved towards ASICs because they were like, well, we're not going to be able to do that. So I'm curious what, you know, what size or what scale you're thinking of when you're when you're pushing, uh, you know, that FPGAs might might have this power. Sure. I mean, I, I really do think that like some of the reasons that people are skeptical, for example, of putting FPGAs in phones still is that is, is sort of a perception and ecosystem problem. That is, it's not that there's anything like fundamentally wrong with reconfiguring FPGAs to do like one application and then do another. It's that the tools don't exist uh, to like to do, you know, for example, like operating system protection to like make sure that applications when they load things onto their FPGA uh, won't like conflict with some other application that's trying to use the FPGA. But like all these things are logistically really annoying because FPGAs don't have a software ecosystem around them. And I don't think it's quite as much about like the actual intrinsic properties of what makes an FPGA good at doing some computations and bad at others. Okay. I, sorry, I, this is Pramesh Amanathan from ECE. So I, I probably not prolong this conversation, but when we talk about FPGA, do we mean the kind of the traditional old FPGA where it was a multiplexer, the memory as an input and the thing, but today's FPGA has come with so many other accelerators built in, right? right. I mean, there's the DSP, there's the, maybe in uh, different types of IP cores that are in there that are facilitating it. I mean, so it's not just, so when we ask what is good for FPGA, I mean, we don't necessarily only mean just that reconfigured part, but also the accelerators that goes with it. I mean, so it's not- Absolutely right. Not, there's nothing like what is an FPGA. I mean, there's a, network function tailored FPGA or a DSP tailored FPGA or something that is what is available today. I mean, where only a part of it is reconfigurable in some real sense. Absolutely, yeah, right. So I think that that you're absolutely right. And I think it's dangerous to conflate FPGAs with just like, you know, you can implement an arbitrary circuit because you're right, today's FPGAs have like, you know, the, the, the reason they're able to be successful is because they have a mix of this like circuit-like reprogrammability made out of LUTs and a whole bunch of parallel resources that you can, uh, that, that are baked into the hardware that you can like exploit to accelerate a given application. So yeah, it, it, one should not get confused and think that FPGAs are like the idealized, uh, uh, you know, everything is just a, uh, a reconfigurable gate and you're just wiring things up. That's, that's not what FPGAs are today and that's not why they are exciting for acceleration. And of course, all these IP blocks exacerbate the programming problem. Yeah. So anyway, actually, let's let's talk about programming. Uh, let's, let's talk about like how you program FPGAs, and the mainstream answer to like how you program an FPGA, like what what the programming model looks like, is that you repurpose the programming models for designing actual silicon, and by that I mean RTL uh, hardware description languages like Verilog and VHDL, obviously, but um, more. Uh, niche languages like BlueSpec and modern things like Chisel are all examples of languages that work at this register transfer level, RTL level of abstraction. Um, and they were made for making actual circuits. And because FPGAs were originally thought of as uh, circuit emulators, of course they were repurposed to program FPGAs. And uh, to this day, if you buy an FPGA, this is uh, in practice kind of the only way to program them at the lowest possible level. Um, that is like the vendor tool chains are extremely fat to go from uh, RTL that could be mapped to silicon to an actual configuration for the FPGA, but uh, that's what you get to use. So in that sense, in that very, very rough sense, you can think of RTL as sort of like the assembly language um, for FPGAs as assembly is for, um, as assembly is for uh, programming CPUs. Uh, this, if, um, Matt was referring previously to a talk that I gave that like questioned this analogy, but like a, a very rough sense, you can think of this as like a very low level description of what's going on uh, that can be mapped more or less to the hardware resources. Uh, and that also means that it is pretty hard to use. <laughs> that is that there's, there are excuses, for example, in the CPU world when you would want to hand code your assembly, obviously, like when there's like a really tight inner loop that you'd like really, uh, that the compiler does a bad job at and you would love to, uh, to, hand optimize, it makes absolute sense that you would uh, do a similar thing for like specific critical pieces of uh, an FPGA design at the RTL level. Um, but in general, if you want to build like large designs, it's really hard to see how assembly scales, even to like 
moderately complex, fast CPU programs. And in my view, it is, uh, it's hard to see how for mainstream programming of hardware accelerators, it's hard to see how RTL can scale to like democratize access to acceleration on FPGAs. So a question that I think is worth asking is like, what is the next level abstraction up? So CPUs, you can sort of think, roughly speaking, C is kind of, uh, is, is a, uh, it's a, it's a, at one sense, it has a sort of direct control over the same kinds of abstractions that assembly has, but it really has a meaningful difference in like the kinds of things you're able to express. That is like, it, it, if you can get away with it, programming in C is, uh, is a great way to build larger programs to run a CPU than you could just writing everything in assembly by hand. So it's worth asking like what the analog is for FPGAs. Um, and the hardware design world, the EDA world, has an answer to this question. What is the analog to C that sits above RTL for FPGA land? And the answer is C. That is, for a couple of decades now, there's been a field called high-level synthesis, whose whole idea is building compilers from C to RTL to make it easier to design accelerators. Um, to give you sort of an idea of where this notion came from in the kind of in the EDA world and especially the FPGA programming world. I wanted to pick on this tiny fragment from an anonymous uh, HLS paper. Um, I think this is kind of a remarkable sentence. So I'm actually just going to read it out loud. It says, since RTL programming in VHDL or Verilog is unacceptable to most application software developers, it is essential to provide a highly automated compilation synthesis flow from C++ to FPGAs. The, th the reason I have this sentence here, and the reason I think it's remarkable, is that I agree so strongly with the first half, and I disagree so strongly with the second half. That is, it's not necessarily an implication to say that Verilog is unacceptable, and I agree that it is, for most mainstream programmers to design accelerators in. However, it, it, it's, not, it's not necessarily an implication that we have to therefore turn to C as the higher level language. And in fact, I think this is a mistake. Because when we're thinking about designing languages for accelerator, for, uh, when we're designing accelerators for designing uh, designing languages for designing hardware accelerators, it doesn't make sense to repurpose a software tool. I think hopefully for obvious reasons, that there is a reason that uh, C is thought of as kind of a literal description of what's going on in a CPU. And it is those same things that make it an inappropriate abstraction for what's going on in reconfigurable hardware. So this, in some ways, the provocative motivation section of my talk, and it's the reason that I showed this imbalance at the very beginning. That is that I think we need to, uh, to rethink how we program accelerators, especially for reconfigurable hardware. And uh, that the idea that C is a good high-level language for doing that is a symptom of these tools being designed too much by architects and not examined enough by the programming languages and compilers community. Anyone have any uh, questions at this point before I get into like actual research? All right, rad. Um, so to sort of lay out a vision of where I think we can go with this, um, I'm drawing a little bit of a system stack here that's analogous to like the compiler stack to for uh, for CPUs, giving like a picture of how high-level accelerator design languages get turned into uh, configurations for the uh, for FPGAs. At, at the very bottom of this, it says LUTs or lookup tables. Um, for the less FPGA initiated in the audience, that's kind of like the basic unit of reconfigurability in an FPGA. Um, so what I'm gonna talk about today is a programming language that we're working on that uh, tries to bring some sanity back to the world of high-level synthesis um, in opposition to just repurposing C. That's gonna be the bulk of the talk. Um, this is going to be kind of layered on top of existing high-level synthesis tools. Our language is called Dahlia, and it gives you a type system that tries to uh, restrain the wild west of crazy uh, HLS tools and make them, um, in some sense, predictable. Uh, I'm also going to give you just a tiny preview of some stuff we're doing right now, some stuff we're in the, in the very early stages of, in fact. I'm trying to design uh, compilers that uh, that that bring high-level languages like Dahlia and we hope future accelerator design languages down to RTL. But I also want to point out that like the rest of the system stack that is like going all the way from the from um, from high-level languages all the way down to the redesigning the hardware itself, I think is up for reinterpretation from 
the lens of programmers and of, of programming languages and compilers. That is, there is uh, there's a tremendous amount of opportunity here for us to rethink um, an entire uh, stack of abstractions that was originally meant for emulating circuits and instead redesign it uh, in with accelerator design, with like usable accelerator design uh, in mind, with uh, sort of program efficiency as the main goal. So I'm going to talk about Dahlia, um, our, our sort of look at the high level language part of this stack next. Basically, the problem that we think goes on with traditional HLS tools is that they feel when you're programming with them like a gigantic black box that you are, um, that C is certainly not a low level language for programming FPGAs in the sense that it doesn't give you direct control over the hardware. Instead, what you're doing is writing a very high level language and like coming up with a few hints and dumping them into this black box and hoping that it comes up with a, uh, with a reasonable accelerator that does something like what you wanted. And our hope is that by kind of re-examining this from the first principles, we can make it feel quite a bit different. That is that you're writing a program that still has computational semantics, but, but talks directly about hardware resources. So in a sense, this is going to be harder to use because you actually have to think about the FPGA when you're programming, about kind of hardware-y concerns. Um, but on, in the other sense, we hope it is, in the end, easier to use because you get guarantees from the compiler about what's going to do. That is like the semantics and the performance is now actually visible to you as a programmer instead of you feeling like you are just twiddling with the inputs to this, to a very large black box that makes up a high-level synth synthesis compiler. So here's the kind of research question that uh, our language asks, which is, can we take some sort of a higher level programming model, higher level than RTL, and imbue it with some sort of predictable semantics about how it corresponds to the generated hardware? To get at that, I want to uh, give you a taste of what it feels like to use real HLS tools today. So I'm going to uh, walk you through trying to use a C-based HLS tool. This is the, uh, the one that the FPJ vendor Xilinx sells called Vovato HLS. And we'll see um, hopefully what makes it, what, like what are the good parts that are worth preserving and what are the parts that lead to unpredictability. So on this slide, I've written the code for a, a really straightforward matrix multiply kernel. Um, there are uh, three memories here. The M1 and M2 are the inputs and prod is the output. And we're just using this like temporary sum variable to like do the dot product that's in the in the inner loop. Um, if you feed this through Vado HLS, the, um, this like commercial HLS tool, uh, one amazing thing is it actually works. That is, it actually does produce you an accelerator. Uh, to give you an idea of what that looks like, here's kind of a block diagram of what happens. The arrays get turned into these things called block rams, which are these uh, small on-chip memories that can be clustered together to create uh, the illusion of having physical memories in a hardware circuit. And then the, the, uh, the sort of contents, the bodies of the loops, uh, turned into combinational logic that is synthesized onto the, um, onto the FPGA. So like the multiply and the adder, those turn into uh, like either literally just circuits or using the on-chip uh, hardened multiplies or adders if those are available. Um, and then the sum variable that we're reading and writing to, to that is only a, a single int, um, that, uh, that turns into a register on the FPGA. So like amazingly, this like does kind of work. You can take this like fairly regular type of program um, and turn it into uh, turn it into an accelerator automatically, which is the magic of HLS. Um, of course, this is not the world's greatest accelerator. Um, it doesn't get any meaningful parallelism, which should be the strength of designing custom hardware to run an FPGA. That is like we can only multiply and add a single pair of elements at a time. Um, so the main thing that you try to do when you're using these tools is to insert some hints into the program to try to get a better accelerator. So the first thing that you might do is look up the syntax for um, for how for what's called uh, loop unrolling, although it's a bit different from uh, loop unrolling as you might think of it in, in, in like a traditional software compiler. What this like pragma HLS unroll uh, thing does, and this is actually literally the syntax for Vado HLS is it takes the body of that inner loop, that is the multiplier and the adder, that logic, and it duplicates it uh, a certain number of times and hopes to run that in parallel. So the point is that you can ask the tool to like create multiple copies of the logic to get additional parallelism, and that will create a larger accelerator, that is it'll take up more of the FPGA's physical resources, but it'll hopefully do your computation faster. 
Um, so let's see how that works out. I'm going to be showing you slides like this over the next section uh, a few times. And what I'm showing you is the results of generating an accelerator um, from the program we saw in the previous slide through Avado HLS. And I want to emphasize for people who have used tools before that this is uh, this is a these are real results from running this on an actual FPGA. So these are not the estimates from the HLS tool. And so we mapped this to an FPGA and measured the actual milliseconds used uh, to to with a you know with an actual stopwatch, not a literal stopwatch, with uh, real time to see how long the accelerator uh, took. And what I'm showing you is two different plots. And I alluded to a second ago that the main factors you care about are the area, that is like how much of the FPGA is being used. That's the LUT used on the left-hand plot here, and the performance. So that's the runtime uh, in milliseconds on the, on the right-hand plot here. So you, what you would expect is that if you do this unrolling thing, that is you ask the HLS tool nicely to create duplicates of the logic, you should, gradually speaking, get a larger and larger design that runs faster and faster. So we should see a smooth trend going upward in the left-hand graph and downward in the right-hand graph, which would be really nice, but it's exactly what doesn't happen. It, the actual results look something like this and look incredibly complicated. And in general, you don't get a faster accelerator. That is like, there are some of these that are like, you know, the, the, the uh, y-axis does not begin at zero on the, on the uh, runtime graph. But you can see that like, there are variations in the timing, but it's not like you can spend additional area in order to get better performance. So uh, if you were using this tool, I think you would find this surprising, uh, especially if you were coming to accelerator design for the first time and you had sort of rough understanding of what was going on in the hardware, but didn't know all the low level details. To understand what's actually happening here, you kind of have to imagine again what the accelerator, what the HLS compiler uh, has to do for you in order to satisfy what you asked for. So you asked for, uh, you asked for unrolling, which means duplicating the body, duplicating the logic corresponding to a loop body. So we got a lot of multipliers. The only trouble is you didn't tell it, you didn't give it enough information to tell it how to, uh, how to run your accelerator in parallel. So what I'm showing you here is a block diagram where we got several multipliers that could hypothetically run in parallel if given the opportunity, but uh, memories are also physical objects that can also kind of only do one thing at a time. So these uh, trapezoid things that are in the circuit diagram are multiplexers showing that what you actually need to do in order to like implement the instructions that you have given to the HLS compiler is sort of uh, switch between the various multipliers and say, uh, and use one at a time because we can only uh, use the memories, we can only get one thing out of the memories uh, at a time that is like in a given physical hardware cycle. If you were to take this problem to say your office mate who happens to be a hardware expert, they might have some advice for you, which is that the thing to do to get the parallelism you wanted in the first place would be to partition your memories. So instead of having one large memory for, the, for each of the two input matrices, you can break it up into several that can be wired directly into the multipliers. This means you don't need the extra circuitry for the multiplexing. And also, now you have enough bandwidth to get out of your memories in aggregate that you might actually be able to get the parallelism that you want. That, of course, the way you do that is with more pragmas. So if we return to our example, what you have to do in Vivado HLS is add a bunch more annotations here to say, uh, let's partition, our, uh, partition the memories a few times and ac hopefully access them in parallel. So again, we're like adding hints on top of hints and asking the HLS compiler to please give us the best accelerator it can under the circumstances. Hey, Adrian, this, this is Tom. It looked like the plus yeah. was also a choke point. Yeah, so that's actually uh, a, a complication we will have to worry about. This, so this giant plus here, um, I'll alight it for this actual discussion, but what's going on here is instead of having like one adder with a bunch of inputs, the HLS tool will, uh, will fortunately be able to generate kind of a tree of adders that will give you the performance you want. But yes, this is sort of another thing that it is forced to do because you asked for the parallelism, but there were still cross loop iteration dependencies, cross but, iteration and, dependencies. But that one happens automatically, that the HLS compilers are able to do that. Right, so it does do that automatically. Um, yeah, this is, this is with our experiments with Vivado HLS. It does, it does give you the tree of adders correctly. That is like, it gives you sort of the parallelism in the computation, but it doesn't do this sort of like global thing where it looks elsewhere for what it has to do to the memories. Does that make sense? Uh, yep, thanks. Great, yeah. Uh, okay, so let's see how that turned out with our plots here. Again, there's the area um, where higher is worse on the left, and then there's the runtime where, uh, 
where uh, lower is, wait, did I say that correctly? Uh, yeah, so on, on the left, higher is worse, and on the right, uh, lower is better. So they both go in the same direction in terms of goodness, right? Do I have that right? Yes. Um, in any case, so let's see what happens when we are, are now, uh, we've, we've fixed the uh, unrolling factor on the loop, and we're going to vary the partitioning factor that we put into those annotations on the previous slide from two up through 10. And it would be nice if we now got like additional parallelism out of the memories and those tur that turned into being able to feed the parallelism that's available in the loop bodies, that is in the multipliers. In fact, we get something that looks like this. I'll explain the, uh, explain the colors in just a second. Um, the, uh, they, did, they don't mean anything about the tool, about the results for the tool itself. But what we see is that, again, we end up with something that is fundamentally really unpredictable. That is like, the more you increase the partitioning factor, it's not like you uh, create additional parallelism that is then able to be perfectly exploited by the, uh, by the parallel computation hardware. But the reason I put colors on here is because a subset of these design points in some way do, roughly speaking, seem to behave predictably. That is, like, if we look at these, um, this subset, it is true that we are actually getting performance on kind of a regular cadence, and we're not expending a huge amount of additional LUTs, additional area, in order to implement the specification we asked for. And the reason that your hardware expert office mate forgot to tell you is that in order to get reasonable hardware that doesn't require a bunch of uh, additional interposers, additional multiplexing, is that your banking factors for the memories you use when a loop should probably divide the unrolling factor for those loops. That is, if you think about it for a few seconds, this might sort of make sense. That is that you, uh, you, need a, you don't need all that much hardware if uh, the amount of parallelism available in like the, the sort of the processing part of the loop sort of fits nicely into evenly divisible chunks of the memories. So for example, if they're exactly equal, like in the diagram that I showed before, you can kind of directly hook up memories to the processing elements. And if you have twice as many memories as you do processing elements, then you don't need that much additional hardware because you can easily just kind of switch in between the two sets of memories you're using in any given iteration. But if they really don't align whatsoever, then there's no nice striding to be taken care of. And the HLS tool will blindly follow your advice and try to make it work but end up inserting a whole bunch of additional hardware and not getting the speed that you asked for. So that's why the partitioning factor also creates this kind of like unpredictable effect. We can also see this from the other side if we instead decide to, change, to fix the partitioning scheme and change the unrolling factor. So here I'm showing that every, uh, every memory in this array is now, being, uh, now has partitioning factor eight and I'm changing the unrolling factor from two up through 16. And we get a similar kind of unpredictable results in terms of both area and performance, um, except for a subset that seem to behave reasonably. Um, the, an interesting thing about this experiment is this is the first time that we saw actually incorrect hardware. That is like in some, some combinations, the, these parameters are so bad that for some reason we actually don't have a, a uh, we haven't tracked down the actual bug in Vivado HLS because it's closed source, but it gave us hardware that correctly synthesized that like would successfully synthesize onto the FPGA but produced wrong answers um, because the uh, for whatever reason the tool was so unhappy to have that particular combination of parameters. So from a programmer's perspective, the way this feels is that there's kind of some kind of hidden correspondence that the compiler and the tool stack is enforcing without your knowledge. That is that like there uh, there's this global uh, it, this is this sort of global set of conflicts that can occur if you're not careful in the uh, factors that you choose for the unrolling and baking. Um, so if you are careful and you sort of see that this loop accesses these, these memories and then those memories need to be partitioned with the same or a uh, dividing factor of the unrolling factor for the loop, then it should be that everything pretty much works out. So let's see how that works then. So on this plot, I'm showing you again those, those same two plots. Um, on this time, I'm varying the partitioning and rolling factor together, so they're actually equal, so they do divide each other. Um, and it should be now that we get that sort of nice trade-off between area and runtime. And by now, I think you should probably be unsurprised that that does not in fact happen, that there is something else that your hardware friend forgot to tell you, which is that it would be really great if you uh, were careful with your loop bounds, so that when you're iterating over memories, you don't have, uh, you don't have a set of 
of sort of parallel loop bodies that hang off the edge of the array instead of neatly fitting into the, the uh, neatly fit, dividing into the capacity of the array. If you do that, then uh, the HLS tool will again blindly follow your instructions and say, great, I have given you the amount of parallelism you wanted, but also insert a bunch of additional hardware to make sure that you haven't fallen off the end of the array. So again, we have this kind of like hidden correspondence between parameters that this time appear as actual like uh, parameters in the program as opposed to the annotations and the annotations that you are responsible for enforcing yourself as a, as a user of HLS tools. So I hope it's clear by now that it's like little walk they're trying to build a matrix multiply accelerator. Why I'm saying that HLS tools feel like this, why they feel like a gigantic black box. You're, uh, you're taking a, a very high level program for FPGAs and giving it a few hints and a, and a, uh, and a sophisticated black box full of a bunch of program analyses and transformations is kind of second guessing what you asked. There's a whole bunch of additional checking that goes on uh, to try to follow your orders in a kind of artistic way and give you the best performance possible under the circumstances. Um, th there's a lot of like sort of ways to root cause what sort of went wrong with designing this programming model so that it was it's so hard to control. But in a word, I kind of think that what's going on here is that the uh, HLS tools traditionally have prioritized the optimality of the design that they want to generate over the visibility and control that they offer the programmer. That is, they are taking your annotations and taking your program and trying to do their best to produce a really good design, the best design it can possibly think of. And it's doing that, and it's doing kind of, in, in some ways, an admirable job of making that work in a remarkable variety of circumstances. Uh, however, it's doing that in a way that doesn't even try to like make it explicable to you, the programmer. So that's why uh, the the language that I'm going to describe tries to instead take all those ad hoc checks that go into the big black box of the compiler and raise them up to constraint checks that we can enforce at the language layer that we can actually explain to the programmer in the form of error messages or uh, proactively in the form of describing like exactly what rules must be obeyed in the language in order for you to get a good design. Uh, so I'm not going to describe that language. And I want to uh, like sort of put the capsule idea of our language Dahlia on one slide, which is that Dahlia is a type system that tries to enforce those constraints by tracking in the language uh, the sort of physical resources that you're using in a design as uh, exhaustible resources as modeled in the language. Um, so that's the high level pitch. I'm going to show you sort of a taste of what the language looks like, but I think now might be another time to ask for questions if people have them. All right, um, so let's look at a little bit of code. Um, I'm going to show you some Dahlia code um, on the next few slides and give you sort of a high level view of how it contrasts with using a traditional C based HLS tool. Um, the first thing that we need is a way to declare things that uh, correspond to actual physical memories. So instead of declaring logical arrays, as we do in C, this like decal thing that's happening here is saying, please allocate me for me a like a physical resource on the FPGA that I can think of as a memory that stores data. Um, these memories, uh, these block rams in FPGA terminology, they behave like arrays. That is, you can access them uh, using subscripting, as you're familiar with from in C. But the thing that makes them different is that instead of just being arrays that you can access in any particular way, they are constrained. That is that they, uh, you're not allowed to use them twice without asking permission. So if you try to run this program in Dahlia, if you try to compile this program in Dahlia, it'll give you a type error saying that the memory A has already been used here. Meaning that uh, what you're trying to do here is to try to have two simultaneous accesses to the same physical hardware structure that can only do one thing at a time. And the tricky thing about this is the uh, an unassuming part of Dahlia syntax, which is the semicolon. And in some ways, the trickiest part of the Dahlia programming model is that semicolon doesn't mean what semicolon means in most other programming languages. Semicolon usually means sequential composition. Do this and then do this. In Dahlia, it tries to express what's actually going on in HLS compilers, which is that those two things may be allowed to run in parallel. Um, across semicolons, Dahlia still tries to, still does enforce like ordering through uh, data flow dependencies, but the resource consumption of the thing on the left and the right are assumed that the compiler might attempt to run them in parallel. This is kind of a reflection of the fact 
if you want to think of it this way, that when you're designing accelerators, when you're using FPGAs, everything sort of needs to be parallel by default. That is like everything, uh, the, the only thing that, only reason you'd be designing uh, FPGA accelerators is to try to get the most parallelism you possibly can. So semicolon uh, gives the, uh, in Dahlia, gives the compiler permission to run these things in parallel if allowed by data flow edges, which is why we, uh, we prevent this program, why this is illegal in Dahlia. We might need to read and write the same memory in the same clock cycle, which is the, the kind of core of the invariance that uh, Dahlia is trying to prevent. So here's a program to illustrate the kind of like data flow dependencies that is still preserved through Dahlia semicolon, through uh, this kind of unordered composition that goes into uh, the Dahlia language. That is, if you use these local variables, which correspond to either wires or registers, um, you can create data flow edges that are still respected by the compiler. The thing you're not allowed to do is to consume those physical resources, which here are memories, uh, twice in, uh, in parallel, potentially in parallel. Um, to make programs legal that would otherwise be illegal, we had to introduce another connector, um, which does actually do sequential composition, which is like the ordered composition of two different programs. And that uh, uses the very funky syntax, uh, a triple dash in Dahlia, meaning that if you say a, then a triple dash B, it sort of looks like a dividing line, meaning that there, uh, in our terminology, there is a logical time step occurring, uh, that these, these two things run in two different logical time steps, meaning that they're allowed to reuse the same resources because they're guaranteed to run uh, one after the other. So this program, for example, is okay. If you uh, try to use the memory A and then use it again in a different logical time step, that's completely fine. This is sort of the soul of Dahlia. You've sort of seen the, uh, the like essence of the underlying semantics, which is that things like memories uh, correspond to physical objects and can be consumed. And they go away when you use them in a logical time step. And they come back in the next logical time step. And you get to craft interesting patterns of parallelism and computation out of these raw materials. So uh, using ordered and unordered composition, you can code up, uh, you can code up interesting patterns where things happen in parallel when they're able to and happen sequentially when they are not. Um, that's the very core of the language. I'm going to show you a few more things, but I want to take questions. So, Adrian, this is permission. So, I mean, is this analogous to uh, in Verilog, the less than equal to sort of and the equal to, I mean, the, the block, blocked execution and unblocked, I mean, parallel execution? Yeah, I think there is an analogy there. I think the difference is that we're sort of talking about like entire chunks of code. So like this is compositional at the level of uh, of computations as opposed to just assignments. Does that make any sense? Okay. I'd actually like to, to follow up on that too, Adrian. So, you know, in Verilog, if I want to have a block of code run in parallel, I can use the non-blocking operator like Pramesh just said on multiple lines in a row. And it seems like that would be analogous to the chunks you have with semicolons before the dash, dash, dash. So I guess I'm trying to, to I mean, I understand your point maybe logically, but not, con, you know, like in the, in the details, how that would actually be different. Sure, yeah, I mean, I, I think you're right. That's how you would accomplish like getting several things to run in parallel. But what what's, I think, I think the, the thing that's different here is again, the compositionality. That is like, you can take a chunk of code that runs in parallel, sorry, runs sequentially here, that is like, a can have like arbitrarily complex stuff in it, some things sequential, some things parallel, and B, and all that stuff must happen after A is finished, and then put it in parallel with these other computations. Does that make sense? I might write an example down to convince myself of that, but it does seem like you, you could do the same thing. Anyways, keep going, and if it's cool. still a question at the end, I'll, I'll ping you. Sounds good. Adrian, okay. I have a quick question. So, so, uh, Great so point. This is Go Tom. Uh, oh. it, it seems like I've heard something kind of like this in talks about Esterel, where they have this, I, they use a phrase which I always thought was kind of bad, which is it, it sort of things run infinitely quickly, but they really mean it's running in the same time slice. And so there is some correspondence here between that and your semicolon, right? That's cool. I actually don't know about uh, that work. You said Esterel? Yeah. It was G Gerard Berry's language for oh, cool. programming Great. hardware kinds of things. It sounds cool. I'm going to look into it. Someone else had a question. Hi. Um, hey, Adrian. It's Josh. I don't know if you could hear me. 
I can. Um, so I just wanted to, so to clarify, are you sort of now asking the programmer to specify the partial um, ordering of basically to build the control flow dependence graph and the data dependence graph of the accelerated portion of the code now? Sort of do what Almost. That, what we're trying to do with the compiler hidden underneath and building your IR. So are you sort of uh, asking them to build their all uh, this dependencies um, specify that already? Um, it's just, is this a concern considering the fact that isn't the fundamental goal of using an FPGA for an accelerator is because I wrote a program already for my CPU and I hope to accelerate this, which is already written in that high level language where I haven't had to reason about these kinds of dependencies? Josh, that's a, that's a good set of questions to discharge them in more or less in order. Uh, we're actually not allowing, we're not requiring people to specify the dependencies that go through data flow edges. That is like assignments and reads from local variables. Those, uh, those still happen automatically. It's the use of resources that we're, to, that we're requiring people to reason about here. That is like when you access memories, that's when you have to think about it. And the answer to that is yes, we're requiring people to deal with that. The answer to like, uh, does this impede porting from software languages? Uh, obviously, yes, it does require additional stuff. That is like the programmer has to think about additional things uh, that they wouldn't have to think about if you just sort of tried to transparently compile a software algorithm to an FPGA. Um, the reason I think this is a reasonable trade-off is because the program still has uh, software-y, computational, and sequential semantics. That is that the program, when fully annotated, you can read it, um, and you can, in fact, run it through an erasure pass, and you get something that looks like C semantics, and you can ask, what is the output? Um, so we still preserve that uh, under the, uh, like, we just need assistance in the form of annotations. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, I sense there may be more questions, but I actually want to get through a little bit more of this language here, if that is all right. Um, I want to show you what goes on with memory banking, which was a big deal in some of the HLS examples I showed you before. Uh, the short answer is that the types of the memories you declare include this banking information. For example, declaring this memory A here to set like a capacity 10 and uh, divide it into five banks. That is actually now the type of that memory that is float bracket 10 bank five is actually how we represent the type of that thing, which means that it is used in the type checking of accesses to the memories. Um, it means, for example, that if you uh, access this from a loop, we need to ensure the unrolling fact, uh, the, the, um, the unrolling factor for the loop that you write down uh, has to sort of match the way you access these memories. That works by, uh, in, by encoding information about the unrolling factor into the type of the loop iterator. So the type of I here is not int. It is a special iterator type that encodes the fact that it, whenever you access something through using the subscript I, that's not going to access the, the memory once. It's going to access it five times in parallel. Um, that is, it's going to access things at sort of like an offset of five uh, from each other. And using this, we can sort of automatically prove that these uh, accesses down here are safe because they go to, uh, con to, to uh, non-conflicting banks of the underlying memories. Um, there's a whole lot more in this language. I'm going to show you some results. I'm not going to tell you about these like additional things we have to build on top. Uh, a thing you may have noticed is that the language like so far is extremely restrictive in terms of like the memory access patterns. That is using this trick where you like sort of, uh, you encode into the iterator, like how much parallel access is going to do, means that you can't reason about like indirect memory accesses or like complicated access patterns. So we built up a, this, this sort of set of combinators that let you uh, build up more and more interesting uh, patterns of accesses to memories while still maintaining the proofs of parallelism that ensure that the loop can still be fully enrolled without inserting additional hidden hardware. So those combinators, like they actually correspond to hardware you have to insert um, to say, for example, um, to access uh, dynamically one of two banks instead of wiring directly into a single bank. And they come with uh, both sort of a mental model of what they cost in hardware and also a semantic model of what they do in the programmer, in the program. Uh, we also added special support just for doing kind of reduction style computations. The loops I showed you so far kind of have to be perfectly parallel, um, but to support uh, not arbitrary cross iteration dependencies, but just reductions, we uh, have sort of a, a harder generation technique that we call combiners. 
the language also talks a lot about multi-ported memories instead of just the memories can uh, be designed at great cost uh, to uh, support more than one access simultaneously and the language can reflect that as well. Um, and finally, we formalize the core of these semantics, that is the basics of the uh, un unordered and unordered composition and the, uh, the, the kind of consumable nature of memories through the use of affine types um, in a formal semantics and a, a fairly understandable big step operational semantics and a really crazy small step operational semantics that we hope are equivalent and we did a soundness proof for the small step operational semantics. Um, so with that sort of description of the language, I want to show you like some results from the perspective of like what it means practically. Um, and one practical constraint that a language like this must satisfy is that it's not overly restrictive. That is like it still allows you to write like reasonable programs. Um, so to do to ask that question, we uh, did this like gigantic design space exploration for a couple of benchmarks um, to try to see whether Dahlia's type system accepted not just like arbitrary designs, but good designs in some sense. So what I'm showing you here is uh, 32,000 different configurations of a blocked matrix multiply accelerator designed uh, in Dahlia. Um, and then we sort of turned off the type checking and ran it through Vivado HLS and got uh, all 32,000 points in terms of the amount of area on the y-axis and the latency, uh, the, the time, it, it, uh, the estimated latency to run it on the x-axis. And uh, my student Retro would be very upset with me if I didn't mention that this took in total 2,666 total compute hours to get all these data points. Um, I'm highlighting here the Pareto optimal designs that Vivado HLS was able to generate. They don't look quite Pareto optimal because they're actually computed with respect to other resources not shown on this, um, not shown on these two axes. Uh, so the question is like these Pareto optimal points that in terms of area and uh, in terms of all the resources and also the latency, are kind of the good design. So it would be great if Dahlia were to accept mostly those designs and mostly not the other ones. So fortunately that is true. That is that Dahlia's type system, if you run the same parameters through it, it type checks successfully uh, um, programs that are mostly on the frontier. Uh, and it does so by shrinking the design space to 354 configurations or about 1.1% of the overall design space. If you want to play with Dahlia or possibly read our upcoming PLDI paper, that is possible. I'm giving you the URL here. Um, Rachet, the lead student on this, also uh, did an amazing job putting together kind of an in-browser demo where you can type programs in and uh, get as many error messages as you would like um, and uh, sort of experiment with what it feels like to use this Athlon type system for, uh, for, tracking, uh, for tracking the resources and the accelerator design. So uh, this puts me at the end of an hour. I have like sort of future worky thing to talk things to talk about, but uh, in the interest of like letting you all go, I want to stop here and take any last questions. And if there are any like stragglers who want to hang on for a couple more minutes, I can talk about that future worky stuff. Thanks everybody. This, this is Mark Hill. I have to run, but I want to say great talk, and it made my day to go to a PL talk that said C is a very high level language. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Thanks for coming. Any questions? Hi, uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, yeah. go for it. Oh, uh, okay. So, hi. Uh, thanks for the talk. Um, my name is Jin Wu, and um, I actually had um, two questions. So, the first one was that um, I'm a bit confused about how um, sequential com composition works in Harbor. So. Um, are the semantics like defined over multiple cycles or something like that? Yeah, it's a little subtle, but I think the, the thing to realize is that uh, in Dahlia, there is only logical time. There is no physical time. That is, there are no actual clock cycles being represented here. So like an oversimplification would be to say that like every triple dash you see is a clock cycle boundary, which is not quite true. There might be like multiple clock cycles that go into a single logical time step. We're just sort of like saying this is ordered before that. Does that at all answer part of your question? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, my second question was like, um, so if you look at a program in Verilog, it's it, it's trying to specify some kind of like um, hardware, like how a CPU should look like or something like that. Um, in my limited experience, but um, if you look at the kinds of programs that um, Dahlia or um, the um, HLS stuff from Xilinx was. Um, 
accepting it looked more like that it accepted a traditional program and it was trying to generate um a hardware that would run well on that specific program and am i kind of right about this intuition uh, yeah, but I think I think you're right about the intuition, but I think that uh, there's actually not as large a distinction as you're thinking. That is like a CPU design is a really complicated like thing that you can design in Verilog and a matrix multiply is another thing that you can design in Verilog. Uh, and there's, there's, there's not like sort of a sharp distinction between like what you would use HLS for versus what you would use uh, Verilog for. Does that answer your question at all? Uh, yeah, I think so. Thanks. Okay. okay. And this is Parmesh again. Uh, so in your thing about A sequential B in parallel with C sequential D, I mean, in that syntax, I mean, if the number of clock cycles for A and A sequential B was substantially larger than C, C, D, I mean, is it the programmer's responsibility to sort of make sure that the, the two parallel blocks are of roughly same number of clock cycles or what exactly would, I mean, or, how exactly 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 Exactly, 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 just in case Pramesh can hear me, uh, Pramesh can you read that? Exactly, 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 Okay, the, the answer to his question for what's worth is basically yes, that is, <laughs> that is, I would, uh, we, exactly, exactly, uh, we, exactly, exactly, we do exactly, depend on exactly, programmers exactly, to like exactly, reason about exactly, performance exactly, at that kind exactly, of level. Exactly, 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 exactly. Hilarious. I think for me, somebody should tell you that whenever you mute yourself, you, we, we hear your voice repeated constantly, like exactly, exactly, exactly. So you should probably not unmute yourself anymore. Right. So Adrian should probably answer the question. Uh, sorry, the, the, okay, the, the, the rough answer is yes. The, that is like sort of a concern that we're relying on programmers to think about is like balancing the amount of parallel work um, to be done across an ordered composition. Yeah. Adrian, I have a question. Great. Yeah, so um, I guess so one of the optimizations you looked at specifically was exposing the the bank parallelism of the available block RAMs, the memory. Um, mm -hmm. But there are many different kinds of optimizations. Um, where does it stop? For example, as uh, Parmesh was alluding to, there are more hard blocks um, coming into FPGAs nowadays. If I have a hard floating point unit that has limited availability for floating point multiplies, um, how would Dahlia be able to deal with that constraint? Uh, that is a great question. So like if you have sort of a limited number of floating point multipliers to allocate, this is something that we are uh, actively working on now. That is like we developed this semantic framework, uh, not just for memories. That's what the paper ended up being about, was about this kind of bank parallelism thing. But it turns out that like everything else in an FPJ is also a consumable physical resource. So we are interested in applying uh, exactly the same type of reasoning to uh, to deal with with computational blocks like this and to be clear one of the challenging parts of this is that you kind of want to do that not just for the physical resources but also the resources that, that come from the fpj fabric itself but also the ones you create so like if your fpga doesn't have floating point multiplies and you make your one yourself out of logic it you would like to sort of track the fact that that can only be used that that like function that you wrote can only be used uh once at a time in the rest of your design Great. And I guess like one last comment is, um, I don't know if you've ever considered, based on all these insights you're finding with your work, can you just go back now and make the HLS tools much better for those uh, of us who are using HLS? 
Well, let me to like skip through a few slides here. But one okay. of the, the like, future worky things, okay, look, there's a whole bunch of stuff about how we need to make let a thousand flowers swim with different uh, tools, uh, not just compilers and languages and stuff. Okay, great, cool. So this is the uh, project I was also going to talk about as, as like very much ongoing stuff, um, which is like a kind of experimental framework for building new languages that compile to FPGAs. So don't quite call it HLS because it's not going to be about programming uh, FPGAs from C. It's going to be about building a framework that like using your, you can design your own language, take your own DSL, make up your own accelerator design language and use our framework to compile down to FPGAs. So yes, we're interested in building this kind of like extensible modular compiler infrastructure, you know, as, as you might imagine, inspired by LLVM um, to uh, give people the ability to, uh, to, you know, to not just design one compiler, but to, to uh, let an infinite number of compilers that generate hardware bloom. Great, awesome work. Cool, I Thanks, think uh, for Adrian, it's uh, it's lunchtime, so I don't wanna spend more of his time. He probably has to go out in the farm and, uh, you know, make his food from scratch. So- uh, Long day of weeding ahead, yeah. Right. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Adrian, for uh, joining us today. Uh, that was a great talk, uh, great turnout, and uh, too many questions. Thanks, everybody. I had a really great time. This was super, super cool. And I would love to chat with anyone who is uh, who's still curious about this stuff. Yeah. Thank you, Adrian. Thanks a lot, Adrian. Thanks, y'all. Yep. Thank you.